Hello community, chat GPT. How does it work? Can we explain it in simple terms? It is January 27, 2022, and OpenAI publishes a learning language model to follow instruction. In this research paper, they present instruct GPT models, which are trained with humans in the loop and are now deployed as the default language model for OpenAI. Now, if you look at the training structure of Instruct GPT, you see there are three steps. I will show you them in detail, but just we have now one year of experience with Instruct GPT. Now let's look at Chat GPT. Let's switch back. You see, it is almost identical. So, Chat GPT is brand new, it is great, but nobody knows any details about it. But if we look at Chat GPT and Instruct GPT, we see they have a similar training structure. So, let's learn from Instruct GPT. Here we go. Now, to train Instruct GPT models, the technology or the technique they used is reinforcement learning from human feedback. And yes, you read it right human feedback. This is it. This is the critical point. Now, as you can see in step one, we have a human person, a labeler, and in step two, we have a labeler. And if you want, you can read the text on the right hand side, and it tells you there are a lot of human interaction involved and why this is necessary and why it gives you these excellent results. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Step one, what happens? At first, we have a prompt. Now, a prompt is easy, it's a sentence, like here, explain reinforcement learning to a six-year-old. It is a simple sentence. And then you have a person. And this person, what to show me, here is our person, now writes a short abstract to this prompt. Yes, the person sits down and writes a, physically an abstract to this. And you have not one person, but OpenAI are so open source, and congratulations, they say, hey, our labelers are sourced from Scale AI and Upwork. So, we have those people doing the work. And then when we have the written texts from the humans, we use this, what we call as a labeled training data set, to train a GPT-3, or maybe then afterwards a GPT-4. So we have a supervised, fine-tuned GPT model on hundreds and hundreds of human written texts that are from a database where you have here a specific prompt. Now you might say, okay, so I have millions of sentences, so I need thousands of people, and I need ten thousands of people, and maybe I need hundred thousands of people to do this. And yeah, absolutely. Because there are companies like Scale, as mentioned by OpenAI, who officially offer this job for you. So here you see it, you have a data collection, you have here a prompt, and then people are writing down here some summary, for example. Now you might ask, how is this possible? Well, this is the new business of micro jobs. So for a task, for example, I found if you ask for the price, it's about five cent per task and three cent per annotation. So let's say you have 100,000 tasks, and let's say you pay eight cents per, per task and annotation. For 100,000 prompts and, and summaries, they just cost you, and I mean really, just cost you 8,000 US dollars. And you have 100,000 trained perfect exactly by you defined prompts and the human text, when humans have written the text, what is the ideal answer to this prompt? And you might say, that's amazing. So there, there are hundreds and thousands of people. No, there are more. And I have a short uh, YouTube short on this topic. It's called The Human Side of Advanced AI. And I show you what I learned from the Oxford, the University of Oxford Internet Institute, that there are tens of thousands of gigs workers and they are especially trained for machine learning algorithms and they do all, they prepare all the training data. And just to give you an idea of the market size, the data labeling market, 
in 2027, as I show you here in my YouTube video, is about 6.5 billion with a B US dollar. So this is a, a significant market size. So 100,000 tasks, no problem. What about 1 million tasks? $80,000? Come on, if you have a system trained then on 1 million tasks, especially designed by you, unbelievable and they are unique you can reuse them whenever you want unbelievable great now second step second step is we have a gpd a machine and we have give this machine a prompt it's the same prompt as you can see explain reinforcement learning to a six-year-old and we have an output from this machine from a model a specific model i don't know how close this model is to a sft model I could find no literature about it, if they are interlinked, if they are share weights, I don't know this. So, you get an output, but you do not get one output, but you get, you run it four times, the same prompt. So you get A, B, C, D. You get four different outputs from your model. And then you have a human again in the loop, and the human now gives ranking. You can do this with good, bad, or the first one, the second one, the third one, however you want to encode, hot encode it. The human now looks at those results and it ranks them. It gives them a specific order, a specific number. And then with this human data set, with this labeled data set by humans, you can run another uh, model, another neural network that is especially trained now on this classification by the humans. And you might ask, how many humans now? 10,000? 100,000? How many? Can you imagine the human manpower? Those people are sitting all over the globe in front of a computer and they get a micro job for eight cents for one task or 10 tasks or 100 tasks and what they earn. Unbelievable. The new micro gig economy. Now you ask yourself maybe, Heaven's sake, where does the intelligence come now in our LLM model? Because up until now, it was just thousands and thousands of people writing and responding and input. But where is now the intelligence coming in? Well, here it is. And as you can see, there was a publication in August 2017 by OpenAI. And they had a new policy optimization algorithm. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with game theory or if you're familiar with control theory or manufacturing, there is a lot of policy optimization algorithms and they found another proximal policy optimization algorithm. Great. If you want, I have here the link to the scientific preprint. Have a look at it. I really recommend it. It is called PPO. P-P-O. Beautiful. Now, there is a short summary on openai.com if you want to have a look at it. But what I recommend is to have a look at the second link. But, but before I show you this link, um, do you remember I had a video on stable diffusion, a completely different topic, latent diffusion, where we had the text to image artificial intelligence. And there I showed you how is it possible that we can create the images in between, you know, images never before seen, never taken with a, with a, with a camera. How is it possible that the algorithm can generate those synthetic pictures of things that are never before have been combined? And I uh, showed you that there is something like a variational autoencoder and I explained the theory and the coding of a variational autoencoder. Uh, auto and I told you that there is this coolback Leibler divergence. Remember, I don't know if you have seen this video, but it's a, a more or less a delta of the probability distributions that we are operating in variational autoencoder. Remember, encoder, decoder. And I showed you how this works in stable diffusion. And you know what? If we now go here to our link towards data science policy gradients in a nutshell, and this is the simplest explanation I found. And here we switch over. So here we are at this article. And I think for me, this is the clearest article I could find explaining policy gradients in a nutshell. So thanks to the author. So here we go. What I want to just tell you, the basic concept is easy. You have an agent, whatever this is. 
And an agent, he does something. He, he performs an action. And this action is performed in an environment and there's an effect of this action. So, I don't know, he, he picks up a flower. So, the environment changes now a little bit. And depending if this was a good action or a bad action, there is a reward value given. Now, imagine that if it's a good action, I give you $10, and if it's a bad action, I give you $0. So, there's a training loop, and if we run through this training loop, depending simply on a numerical value, the reward value, if you want, you learn very fast, the agent learns very fast what actions benefit for the development of the environment of the system as a whole. Because whenever the environment changes because of the action of an agent, the state of the agent also changes. When you read a book, you become a little bit more intelligent. You have some knowledge you can apply. So the next action you performed is done with this additional knowledge and you find solution or paths to solution you have not discovered before. So this is the simple canonical agent environment feedback loop. And this is all there is. It's a control cycle, if you want. So, backgrounds. Yes, beautiful. What well, just want to show you Markov. There's a beautiful Markov chain decision process. You know Markov from variational autoencoder. I showed you in detail what Markov is. Beautiful. The same applies here. A lot of you ask me, what is a policy? Now, a policy is very simple. A probability distributions of actions given a specific state of the system. So, again, like in the variational autoencoder, we had probability and reference probability distribution, the same case here. And yes, there is also the learning objective, yes, 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 and you have here gradient descent or ascent. You know gradient descent from neural network learning, everything comes together, yes, 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 this is clear. Yes, and the expectations, yes, this is just, no, no, no. Likelihood maximization, you have some baseline terms, yes. It looks like theoretical physics. I, I laughed so much when I saw this and said, wow, unbelievable, but this is, this is from automation. This is a control cycle. Great where you can have mathematics today. Yes, and there are other systems. So this is just what I wanted to show you. I leave you the link here also in the description of this video. Now, finally, we come here in the third step where we have now the intelligence. We have now, we apply now our PPO reinforcement learning algorithm. And look what we have. We have a new prompt, so a text never seen before. Not, the model has not been trained on this. But what we have now, we have now two models. We have a model, this very specific model from step one, this supervised fine-tuned GPT 3.x model, and we have a ranking model. So this two model now here in our loop, and I really mean loop, because this first model produces an output, let's say a short summary about, I don't know, 10 lines of text. And then the reward model that we have trained here on our human input, on our human label data set, now classifies and says, hey, this was good, this was bad, this was a 1, this was a 10, this was a 5, whatever ranking scaler you have, whatever reward system you use. And there's a lot of mathematics here in this. This is a, a control algorithm with, a, with really a lot of statistics and mathematics. But independently of this, the first model learns from the second model, and you have here a control loop, if you want, a game theory. So, again, to show you. In the third step, we have our two models, the first model from the first step, the other model, the reward model from the second step, and now these two models learn from each other. So this is it. Again, first step, hundred thousand of people on micro gig economy write text, write essays, and this label data set is used to train a very specific GPT-3.x. Another 100,000, maybe, I don't know how many people, how many men, I would be interested to hear from OpenAI about the amount of resources they invested in this, make now a ranking of an output of a system. And then they train a neural network for this specific reward system. 
So what we have, we have one system, one GPT system that is trained by human text, 100,000 of human text passages to generate text. And then we have a second system, a neural network, maybe it's a GPT-3 uh, system. I have found no documentation about it. And this is now trained on ranking the text. This was a good text, this was a bad text. And now what happens? Model one, our system one here, and our system two, now they learn each other. One produces an output, two judges the output, the output goes back to the first model, tells them, hey, this was not a good output, do better. System produces another text, says, hey, yeah, this was better, this is the right direction, go on. And you see, this here is now the training cycle where this famous PPPO reinforcement learning algorithm comes into play. But what I like to stress and show you here with this simple uh, visualization, we could achieve this because we have this huge globe involving platform of microeconomy, of micro gigs, where hundred thousands of people sit in front of their computer and do a repetitive task and write essays or judge something. Without this, the system would not have its intelligence. Without this, that the humans rank the text from other humans, the machine would not be able to learn. So if you think about this, you train a machine to generate text, and from thousands of people, you train another machine to rank text, and then you let those machines train itself in a loop, so that for all those cases, those, those 100,000 people here did not have on their agenda. Or if there's a topic that is close but not really identical, the system now in the neural network is able with gradient descent, of course, to approximate a solution. But given you have 100,000 uh, solid answers in the label data set, so that in between now the machine is able to do this. So if you now use chat GPT, I think maybe if you look at this, you have a better understanding the amount of work that went into this LLM. And it is simply unbelievable what we can do today in our global economy and how things come together to achieve this particular performance of chat GPT. And thank you to OpenAI for being so transparent to show their processes, to have some research papers out so we can follow at least a year behind their scientific process because other companies are not doing this. So great open AI, although I guess it will be a non-free system when the research phase is over, but at least we as a scientific community can understand what's going on, what is the model. Of course, the internal of the algorithm is, is corporate property, but it is so fascinating to see how those models come together. I say thank you, I hope you enjoyed it a little bit, and now you know how ChatGPT is working. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next video.